we're all raised with this. We grow up with a culture. Whether people say they do or not, you're all raised with a culture. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Troy Geist. I'm the folklorist with the North Dakota Council on the Arts. And I work with the Art for Life program, which you guys have participated in, in this facility, where we bring artists into the facility to work with, with the residents. And this is a special project within our Art for Life program. We thought, let's do something really, really unique and make something really big and collaborative where everybody kind of works together. They have their own kind of ideas to bring into this. The North Dakota Council of the Arts, we started uh, an Art for Life program. And basically what that program is, it's a program that seeks to improve the emotional and physical health of elders living in care facilities by bringing intensive art and artist interaction with the residents. We wanted to help improve their emotional and physical health by having that interaction with artists and art activities. And it has a dramatic impact, uh, almost as dramatic on the artists as on the residents. And the great thing is you say, do a painting with a wheelchair. What does that even mean to anyone? <laughs> so there is a lot of freedom in, in, in that. So once you sit in the chair, once you sort of make that effort to say, okay, I'm gonna give this a try, something magical happens. The person in the chair transforms from being somebody who is piloting a wheelchair to somebody who is really piloting a paintbrush. In a lot of traditional dances too, you've got a leader and a follower, so you're, you're being led around a room in different ways uh, within the, the framework of the dance. So uh, holding his hand and he being in his wheelchair and giving him you know, no instruction other than you move as you want to move, I'm going to follow you. Um, I began to feel myself really in sync with a different style of movement for me. It was tradition based on traditional dance, but because of the movement of the wheelchair, because I wasn't the leading and I wasn't making the decisions, that as he moved and we became doing some things that I'm not used to, that was also cathartic for me. It was kind of like, this is cool. I, gosh, I never even thought about this before. And it, it, it was so moving for me, really moving. This gentleman uh, that I worked with yesterday uh, was, was apprehensive at first. Um, the gentleman was 99 years old, uh, didn't have any interest in, in painting. Uh, he was a farmer, he was a dancer, and it, it was after a little bit of persuasion, he decided to, uh, to give it a try. And he got in there, he started painting, and he did this incredible uh, rhythmic back and forth uh, movement, like he was planting seeds in a crop. And, it was, it was fascinating to, to see that come through. So his aesthetic, the way that he was going to use the mobile painting device was completely up to him. The smile on the face is probably the first giveaway. You can't, uh, you can't fake that smile. We want to do this project, but we also want to make it even more unique and even more wonderful uh, and even a little bit more challenging because we believe that pe people's potential can be pushed regardless of what circumstance they're in. So we brought together traditional artists. We selected four towns and in each of the four towns we'll have a different traditional dancer. In Jamestown we had a dancer from India, Marguerite Sam. In Ellendale we have Mary Louise Defender Wilson, who is a Dakota storyteller and traditionalist. In Enderlin, we have Maureen McDonald Hins, who is a fantastic Irish dancer. Step off onto the blue tarp and let's take a look at what we have. And if you want to make more of a statement, you just keep painting. And in Wapaton, we have James Larock, who's a midship uh, fiddler and jigger. We brought together a wonderful artist, Jeff Noctegall, who invented what is called a mobile painting device, which is basically uh, an extra arm that attaches to a wheelchair that serves as a large paintbrush. Well, we are gonna hook up the mobile painting device um, to this manual wheelchair. 
Um, the first thing that I had to do was develop a mount. I mean, you have to understand, I'm not an engineer, I'm an artist. The wheel, this is, this is actually from an old uh, uh, gate. Uh, it's a swivel uh, caster that I've attached some artificial um, lamb's wool to, so that really holds the paint nicely. Um, and just done a little bit of remanufacturing where this is now a hollow uh, tube because our paint reservoir will sit up here. Um, so that way the paint is being deposited. The reaction we get is, is, is always very positive. There's, there's usually, um, there's a lot of fear in, in trying something. First thing, people don't want to get their chairs dirty. Uh, so we have to reassure them that this is latex paint. We can wash it, it will get clean. Um, and then it's a little bit of coercion, uh, that gentle persuasion uh, to try something that's really outside of the box because a lot of people are uh, uh, afraid of their creativity. They've uh, packed it away. They believe that they're, they're not particularly artistic or creative. Uh, so this is about really uh, reconnecting individuals with their creativity. And certainly if you're in a wheel wheelchair, if you have limited mobility, um, you know, you become hyper aware of your limitations. We all have limitations. Um, every single one of us has a limitation. So it's not to discount the limitation, but it's to use that limitation as a strength instead of a weakness. Mary Lewis Defender Wilson tells a story called uh, The Spider-Man Meets the Giant, which is a wonderful story. And the message behind that story encapsulates this project. And the people got ready. And as soon as they came, into the village, the scent, the, and they were gonna, and the giant was gonna start eating. They started their their songs, hitting their drum, singing their songs, and they were yelling, and then they were also blowing the whistle, and the giant just went into a big faint. He just stiffened out and he just fell down. So the Spider Man did something good for once, but the giant was laying there. And the people said, what should we do with him? We should get rid of him once and for all. The giant in the story, metaphorically, is anything that restricts any of us from reaching our true potential. For instance, people in a wheelchair might feel that the wheelchair is the giant because the wheelchair is confining them to that space, confining what they can do. Here the giant had a ring on his little finger. And they say some woman took that ring. So from that ring, the giant still lives among us. So we know that every one of us, we have something on us all the time, something that bothers us, kind of like the giant. So sometimes we let ourselves live inside a giant, but we can always get away. When you think about the story, of the Spider-Man and the giant and all of the actions they went through and the conversations they had. And that it points out several things. I mean, we may feel like, you know, that like maybe like the Spider-Man felt, hungry, homeless, and uh, not of much use maybe, but he made himself useful when he went to the village and told them what the giant was afraid of. Many things happen to us which make us feel maybe that we're imprisoned or we're, we're not able to be free like we would like to be. In today's world, I guess it's a lot of things that are like the giant that are harmful to people. In the story, Mary Louise talks about four things that wake, that uh, kind of debilitates the giant and wakes people up to their capacity. Those four things are the sound of your voice, the sound of the drum, the sound of the whistle, and sound of the rattles. All four things are arts. And it's those arts, when used in a really conscious, deliberate way, that can wake up people to their true abilities, regardless of the circumstances they find. At the Ellendale site, Gail Kwam is a resident and she's in a wheelchair and she really seemed to 
connect to the story that Mary Louise told. It seemed to apply to today's world where we're all trying to uh, live in a, a newly defined uh, you know, world that is um, kind of the battle between the giants and the little people. She really seemed to connect to the activity that took place there, which was the painting of a, a medicine wheel with the mobile uh, painting device and with people's feet. Well, Gail is in a wheelchair, yet she participated in this activity. Uh, she danced. She danced with me. And apparently, she is a poet. She writes poetry. So she wrote a poem about this experience. The sacred dance. On the wings of an eagle, one dances to the drum heartbeat. Yes, I am free. Yes, the colors of the medicine wheel reach me. And yes, I can dance. The sacred room of the church invited many others, some in wheelchairs, to artfully paint a floor canvas with their feet and within the arc of the medicine wheel. It will remind us all of the sacred circle that comes to our sisterhood and brotherhood in dance. Gail Kwan. Uh, one of the things that's extremely important in the Art for Life program, in any kind of facility where, where people are living, sometimes those facilities and those people in the facilities are separated from community, and it is key to their health for a community to be brought back into the lives of the people, into the lives of that institution. So whenever we do these kind of programs, we want the community, we want the family members of the residents, we want the friends of the residents, we want just people from the community at large to come in and be a part of these events, to be a part of the lives of the elders, to interact with the lives of the elders. Uh, too often they are separated, and this is a way to bring people back together. Well, they took me down in a wheelchair and they wanted people to volunteer and be in, they said we'd be painting. So they got us in the circle and they poured puddles of paint down and took our socks off and let us swirl around in this paint. It was just, I thought it was so refreshing. Something new I'd never done in my life. <laughs> and you're never too old to do something new. Just like a light, just really light. I mean, you had no worries. And I, I don't know, it just made me probably like an angel. <laughs> it's got to be part of heaven. Culture is a tool that allows us to navigate the world around us. So when people are sometimes removed from the world, they may be placed in an elder care facility or a hospital or a wheelchair. These unwieldy things that might at first seem to be giants. You're separated from the larger community. What sometimes happens is those cultural things that they use to navigate the world are taken away from them. All these things that allowed them to live and navigate that world when those are taken away from them in a situation or an institution when they most need it, in a time that is so different and sometimes stressful for them, to not have those tools only worsens the situation, worsens the person's health. To allow them to have those tools again through traditional culture, traditional arts, through other types of arts. You allow them to navigate this new world that they find themselves in. They need to have those tools. Well, if we become too dependent again, that is like living in the giant. I think we have to kind of learn to, to take, look at alternatives and, and hopefully they're available to us and look at real alternatives. And that's what the, the people did then 
And if we have to do certain things in order to save ourselves, then we have to do it. 